Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Podcast. My guest today is Matt Irvin, a.k.a. Sifu Matt. Matt is a Oakland-based martial artist, martial arts teacher. He's the creator and founder of Essence of Evolution America and has a blog and YouTube channel by the same name. Uh, Matt, thanks for joining me today. Yeah. Good to talk to you. Before we get into the whole Essence of Evolution thing, could you tell us a little bit about your background pre-EOE? How did you get into martial arts? How old were you? Why did you start? Certainly. Um, in a way, it's kind of hard to say when exactly I started because, you know, even as a kid, you know, I would watch kung fu movies or martial arts movies and run around in my yard trying to, you know, I'm, I'm Donatello, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. I first uh, officially started learning 1993 or thereabouts. Um, and it was one of those like uh, after school karate programs kind of a thing. And I just got really into it from there and continued with that same teacher. This was Sensei George DaCosta through high school. And also when I was in high school, I spent a couple of years learning Aikido and Shinkendo at the Aikido Shinrei Dojo, which is out here in Livermore. So I did that. And then I went to college in Los Angeles. So I went to UCLA. And when I got there, it was kind of like paradise because at the student union on campus, they had martial arts classes you could sign up for. And there must have been a dozen different classes on right. that list. So I signed up for everything I could fit into my schedule. Right. So uh, at that time, I spent a few years doing Jeet Kune Do and Kali with uh, Sifu Mark Stewart. And uh, I was also learning Kung Fu San Su from Daniele Bolelli oh, yeah. and just doing lightweight college fight club stuff. You know what I mean? Like meeting other martial artists and doing this and doing that, messing around with a little bit of, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and these kind of things. Um, and then in 99, I met a student of Master Su's. Uh, and it's kind of funny how I met him. So he was coming around to all the different martial arts classes on campus, just seeing who might be interested in going to a seminar with Master Sue, right? So it's like, he shows up Tuesday night at this class, I'm there. He shows up at Wednesday night at another class, I'm there. <laughs> Thursday night, same thing. So he's like, oh, this guy really likes martial arts. So he gave me like a brief introduction and uh, like a couple of things. One... This dude was really fast, really smooth, and really powerful, yeah. right? But two, the way that he was talking about it was not how I'd ever heard anybody talk about martial arts. He was breaking down the principle, and that was what got my attention, right? I was like, oh, I feel like he took a bunch of miscellaneous, all kind of this other stuff, and put it in a format that makes sense to me, right? Right. So... He put together a little demonstration for Master Sue and me and a couple of other folks in the basement of some office at UCLA because the student worked on campus. Um, we went and that was how I met Master Sue and he gave an EOE demonstration. He must have talked to us for four or five hours. Uh, wow. Meanwhile, beating the hell out of the student. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because and and the so we talked about uh the DAOI blog and I'm yeah. working on a piece for that and I right. talked about it in there during this entire afternoon that Master Zhu was do, doing the demonstration, uh he never once mentioned Shingi Bakwa or Tai Chi by name, mm -hmm. right? He was talking about essence of evolution. So that was how I got into that and I started training with the student. And that was how I was introduced to, as we call them, the internal arts, quote unquote. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. So backing up just a little bit, you mentioned uh, Kung Fu Sensu and uh, Jeet Kune Do and Kali, um, uh, Kaju Kenpo. Th these are these are arts that are, you know, uh, ten tend to like see themselves as being reality based, you, you know, pra practical martial arts that are combat oriented um, right. was a. Uh, what was your motivation for studying those arts? Was that just what was available around you at the time? Or did you have a very, were you, were you out to learn things that you felt like that you could use in a uh, actual, you know, like encounter as opposed to just learning a martial art for its own sake? Right. 
Right. Um, it was a combination of factors. Uh, first and foremost, I just always really liked martial arts. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I, the, the movement, the environment, the camaraderie, you know what I mean? Like, uh, because I'm a hemophiliac, uh, so I bruise and injure easily, much more easily than most people. Mm. I never got into sports or anything like that. Yeah. So martial arts for me kind of provided what maybe organized sports provide for other young people. Um, but also it was just something I was really into Right. as far as the so-called practical applications. I mean, I did have a certain interest in that, uh, mainly because I have a smart ass mouth. And uh, that's the kind of thing that can get you into trouble. That's actually why my parents signed off on me learning martial arts to begin with. <laughs> my mom was like, no, yeah. you better learn to defend yourself because you talk a lot of mess. So, yeah, but I, it, it was never a thing of like, oh, I need to be able to handle myself on the street. Right, I'm right. Not, yeah. like, so some of these guys are a little weird. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Take, take things a little too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I, I imagine that... Um, at least from your your Jeet Kune Do, uh, when when you saw Master Su practice, did you you I guess you could see from what I've seen him practice, he obviously he knows how to fight. I mean, he, <laughs> he, he, you could say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm sure that a man with a very that, colorful history. <laughs> that, that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Uh, but I, I I guess you could you could see that it was like a, something that was I don't want to say you know when I use the term reality based, I'm not trying to say it sound like you know. Uh, uh, tactical Timmy or anything like that, but you could right. see that some, some kind of a functional, functional uh, fighting art. Uh, so, what, what was uh, he living in the United States at that time when you first met him, or was he visiting? Yes, he was actually, and this is funny because this city is currently in the news. Uh, he was living with the student that I mentioned in Monterey Park. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. And basically, so far as I remember, the student had kind of talked master sue into coming here and master sue wanted to come here because he'd been in living in japan for a lot of years Mm. and uh was pretty frustrated with i guess just the japanese mindset as far as like trying to teach people or finding people who could really learn what he was trying to give um so he had an interest in coming to the west and it wasn't his first time being in the states for a period of time either like he spent some time i believe it was in florida uh back in maybe i don't know the 90s early 90s late 80s something like that but he was out in the states for a while at that time went back to japan uh came here again in yeah this would have been 99 and so he was living here for a period of time then he left again and eventually he connected with another chinese martial arts instructor who i also learned from for a period of time sifu marvin kwan uh, whose background was in uh, Choi Li Foot and Northern Shaolin, but also had been doing uh, Tai Chi for a very long time. And they found out through conversation, it, Master Su met him at uh, World Tai Chi Day. I don't know if you guys do that out there. Uh, yeah. this, mm-hmm. this was a big thing in LA. Uh, so they met there and discovered that they were indirect uh, school cousins, right? Nice. Like two of the teachers they had learned from had been school brothers. So they connected. So uh, Sifu Kwan started hosting seminars for Master Su. So he would, Master Su would fly in and out of the States to do seminars. And then at a certain point, I want to say it was around 2002, he came to live in the LA area and he stayed for three years. And that was the period of time that I was learning from him directly. Um, I actually learned Mandarin Chinese specifically so that I could learn from Master Su because wow. Master Su speaks Mandarin, Japanese, and a little bit of English, a little bit of French, uh, but he's not fluent in English, right? Mm-hmm. And I just got tired of going through the other Sifu translating, and I was like, mm, I want to be able to talk to him directly. And I tried learning Japanese, and that didn't work out. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Japanese is a very difficult language. Uh, Chinese for me was a lot easier. Really? That's usually I hear the opposite from people. They have a much easier time with Japanese than Chinese. Yeah. But um, for those of our, our readers, or I'm sorry, our readers, our viewers and listeners that don't know, could you give us a little bit of background about Master Su? Uh, you know, where did, where he came from and what his, what his lineage was? Oh, yeah, most definitely. So uh, Master Su is from the Yizong 
school. Mm. Uh, e zong is the change set, right? So the E is the same E from like the I Ching, right? Um, so there was a master by the name of Zhang Zhengfeng who was from Northern China, from Tianjin. And after the Chinese Civil War, he fled to Taiwan with the, the Guomindang, the nationalists, mm -hmm. right? So he ended up in Taiwan. And uh, he started teaching in the park in Taiwan there. And at the time, this was a big deal. This, like, uh, this was very much in the early days of Chinese martial arts instruction being a public thing, mm -hmm. right? And because he was from the mainland, there were a lot of Taiwanese masters and practitioners who didn't like that he was teaching publicly and teaching arts that weren't theirs and whatever. Because uh, at the time, uh, as we call them, the Neijia, the, the internal, or I prefer to call them the in-family arts. <laughs> That's literally what Neijia means. Nei is inside, Jia is family or house, right. right? So those arts were unknown in Taiwan at that time. And he's teaching them. And... Long story short, he ended up doing a lot of fighting, blah, 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 blah. Uh, his first students on Taiwan were the Hong brothers. So Hong Yixiang, who's right. probably most well-known, uh, Hong Yimian, and I'm blanking on the name of the third brother, who was the oldest. Um, so those were, those were three of his first students. And then Hong Yixiang, he also had a background in judo and some of the other Shaolin arts or whatever. So Hong Yixiang eventually opened a school uh, called the Tang Shou Dao School, right? And because he had studied judo, um, and he admired kind of like the organization of the budo arts that they had done in Japan, he kind of modeled his school after that. So that's why it, the old school footage or pictures of people from the Tang Shou Dao School are wearing Japanese style uniforms, right? right. So Master Su Su Dongchen. He started learning at Hong Yixiang school when he was 14 um, and spent a number, of a, a number of years at that school and was kind of like, I don't want to put too much on this, but was kind of the attack dog for the school, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Master, Master Su is of mixed heritage, right? right? Uh, his mother is Japanese and his father was Chinese, right? And... In that part of the world, if you're part Japanese and part Chinese, you're basically a dog, <laughs> right? So uh, whenever there were visiting students or, or, or visiting people training at the school or, um, you know, like there was a lot, this, this was during the Vietnam War. So there were like a lot of American special forces guys and this kind of thing at right. that school uh, or people came to challenge the school or whatever, whatever. They made Master Su do all the fighting. Um, because if he wins, our Kung Fu is strong. Right. If he loses, well, yeah. he's part Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's a win-win for everybody right. involved. So that was where he came from. And then after that, uh, he moved to Japan and uh, studied or uh, conducted martial arts research with any number of other pretty prominent martial arts masters, uh, Chang Dongshen, who's a famous uh, Chinese wrestling Swai Jiao master. Uh, he met Emi Lichenfield, who created Krav Maga, right. yeah. um, any number of other folks that he met as part of his path. So that's kind of the background of where that comes from. And that that line from Zhang Junfeng to the Hong brothers through Master So and to me is, once again, is called uh, Yi Zong. Right. So what, what was it that uh, compelled him to start um, I guess what was it just his own experience researching that caused him to formulate his, his essence of evolution concepts? Um, or was he was, feeling that something was lacking in his own training? Um, well, I don't know if I want to speak for him like that. Okay, sure. But I, but what I would say is, uh, he's just somebody who's always been really passionate about martial arts and was always trying to figure out the inner workings of it. Right. Like, he published his first book on martial arts at the age of like 20 or 21. Um, and it's interesting. So he he had like one copy of each of these two books that he had done way back then. And he showed me. And of course, they're in Japanese. I can't read them. But yes. a lot of the concepts that 
uh, form the foundation of the essence of evolution theory were already present in those books. So this was something he, he, he was taking the machine apart and looking at how it worked from a very early age, you know, and just, I think as a matter of just passion and interest, you know what I mean? Um, and yet there was definitely a factor of like, okay, this is how I learned this technique. But then when I go get beat up by my senior students or <laughs> beat up in the tournament or beat up on the street, it ain't working this way. I need to figure this out. That was definitely a factor, I would say. So you trained with him for about three years and you, you also traveled with him some during that time, right? Uh, helping yeah. him do demos and things like that. Correct. Um, so I pretty much, I was kind of a seminar apprentice. Uh, mm. He showed me how to uh, organize seminars, how to book things, do things like that. But because, you know, I speak English, I served as the main organizer for these seminars. So, okay. and it's, it's funny, I don't know if you're familiar with this term. They have a term in the Chinese martial arts universe is Jianggu, which means uh, literally rivers and lakes. Right. Yeah. Like the Kung Fu underground. Right. Underworld. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, people would hear about Master Su through the Kung Fu Underground. Well, very nice. And find out that he was in LA. And for that period of time, I was the contact person. So they're like, hey, we want to do a seminar. So yeah, we went to went to New York, Miami, Minnesota, LA. We were kind of all over the place. And I would organize those seminars, uh, book everything with the teachers at those schools, and then translate for the seminars, which I also did for the class, I would translate. So that was an education for you on several fronts then you were. Oh yeah. And I was young. I was like 22, 23. Oh wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't know my ass from a hole in the ground and I'm running around with this guy. But I felt like you, you were probably living the dream at that point though, right? Uh, in, in your yes, mind. What, whether I realized it or not is <laughs> right. another matter, but yeah. So at what point did you decide to start um, teaching on your own was that just out of a like a desire to like keep keep training or or was there or was there another um, motivation behind it um definitely out of a desire to keep training there were other things going on um so master su moved back to japan in 2006 and right around that same time i also split up with my long-term girlfriend wow. right? and the only reason i mentioned that is because it was a period of my life where I didn't exactly know what I was going to do after that. Mm -hmm. Right. And the last time actually that I saw master Sue in person was at a seminar that we did in Miami. And, uh, I told him at that time and I, I hadn't been practicing at all. Um, and I told him at that time, cause this is how I was feeling. I was like, I don't even know if I'm going to keep doing martial arts. Like mm -hmm. I was pretty, I was pretty empty. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and he's kind of like, well, you do or you don't, whatever, you know, <laughs> that's your business, your business, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. And, you know, some time went by and I got over whatever I was going through. And I realized, I started to realize what a precious gift this was that I had learned from him. Yeah. And something that, so the, the teacher whose school we would do seminars at Miami, Sensei Robert Young, highly accomplished martial artist who is trained a number of highly accomplished martial artists, like the dude is a phenomenon, um, and an OG. And I was out there one time just visiting, and I went to see him. And he said something to me that stuck with me. He's like, okay, Master Sue is gone. Uh, who's going to be your teacher now? Mm -hmm. Right? And I was kind of like, you know, I'm Captain Anarchist over here. I'm like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever. But I thought about it a lot. And when I got back, I realized, oh, I have a teacher already. My teacher is this theory. Oh. My teacher is the essence of evolution. So let me take this and really bring it together. So I dug out the master. Sue is a writer. He's mm -hmm. constantly writing reports and theories and outlines and stuff. And he's always working on something. That was another thing I would help him do when he was in the States is translate this stuff. So we'd sit around, he'd use whatever computer translator to translate the Japanese and then hand it to me to make sense out of it, whatever. So I had a stack of my notes and his notes and all this kind of stuff. I 
have it in a folder right here. I'll bust out a little bit over here in a second. Sure. I took all of that stuff and I sat down and I started writing. I was like, and at the time, my idea was I'm going to publish a book where I'm going to lay all of this out. Right. And as I started writing and laying all of this stuff out, light bulbs started going off. Right. And things that he had told me or tried to tell me or tried to teach me over the years started coming together. And so I just started playing with it. Right. So it's like, OK, this is this. Well, what if I try this? What if I try that? Oh, oh. so my skill level started to build mm -hmm. because I was taking that theory that I learned and applying it to training methods. Right. Um, and I was doing that just kind of on my own is like, oh, long term. I'll publish a book or I'll do this or I'll do that. Uh, and I moved back to the Bay Area in 2009. And that was when I got serious about like, okay, I'm going to start producing training videos, right? So I filmed a lot of stuff at that time, but I've always been very ambivalent about the YouTube platform, right? Yeah, like I understand any, that. any number of reasons we could talk right. about. So I kind of vacillated about it for a number of years. And then finally in 2019, I was like, at some point I realized that there are only two people on the planet who have a comprehensive understanding of essence of evolution, Master Sue and me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, if I don't put this out, it may disappear. Yeah. So that's when I was like, I started taking it seriously. And that was also when I started looking seriously at my lineage history because I, I was never into this i wasn't a kung fu lineage nerd guy i didn't care about the internal arts like right. i learned shingy because that's what master Sue was teaching like um but i started looking at the line and i realized like wow all of these people in this lineage are people of major accomplishments yeah right absolutely so beginning the channel and starting to make the information, the theory, the practice, the training methods publicly available also became part of how uh, I honored that. Right. Right. Well, that's that's the best reason to teach something is that you're trying to continue something that was taught to you. Right. I think. Yeah. Right. So maybe you can break it down for us. You, you said on on your blog that uh, uh, essence of evolution is a methodology methodology for uh, researching styles and systems of martial arts. Can, can you explain to our viewers and listeners like the basic concept behind essence of evolution? Absolutely. So uh, three main things of essence of evolution, uh, basis in principle, application of proof method, and those two lead to the third, which is consistent method, right? So principle that's easy uh we all exist in three-dimensional space what does that mean you have up and down left and right front and back those are the three dimensions a three-dimensional structure has an inside and outside uh change of direction in three-dimensional space is a relativity of straight and side right which creates spiral okay. Um, like okay so there's the outline now how do Okay, so what? <laughs> like, okay, well, up, down. Uh, so I have rising and falling. The governing principle behind this is gravity. I can, so that's the principle. Now we jump into proof method. I can demonstrate that with objects. If I pick this up and drop it, <laughs> uh, confirmation of gravity. Right. If I pick it up and use it to hit something, now I'm using an object to transfer power. So proof method slash object method means using objects to practice the transfer of power, right? Now, certain styles from wherever in the world may have as a part of that traditional style certain weapons that they learn how to manipulate or use. Right. Um, but a weapon is a type of object. And if you're within that box of tradition you may only manipulate those objects you're not treating them as objects you're treating them as part of a tradition right right so eoe is not about that it's about objects so this sword that sword this stick this staff this uh length of toilet paper <laughs> this fishing rod whatever whatever that 
I'm now going to manipulate and use the transfer power so that now physics is part of my movement, right? And once you start looking at it in principle, this is where you get into consistent methods. So if I take, uh, and I did a video on this and it hurt a lot of people's feelings. Uh, it's called Essence of Bung Chuen. Yeah, so, that's, how I, that's how I found you actually. Oh yeah? Uh, video, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I watched that story. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll just say this really quickly and then I'll, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I was actually looking for a Bung Chuen video and, and for anybody that's that's watching or listening, Bung Chuen is the uh, the wood fist or, or crushing fist in uh, Shini. And I, I was looking for a video to put up on the uh, Dowie Discord. We have a little Discord server. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason that your video popped up and I started and I was like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> you're like running in place and doing all, all these different types of things. And uh, I sat through a couple minutes of that and I saw what you were doing. I saw how you were relating the, the movement to, to all these different types of movements that human beings do naturally. And I was like, well, that's cool. And then you, you, you gave a little talk and then you came back and we're uh, imitating someone doing sort of like a phony Fajin type movement. And then you finished it off with a semi obscene uh, hand. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, this guy's probably all right. I'm going to see what the rest of the about. <laughs> Excellent. But anyway, so you were the target audience. <laughs> uh, you reached me. You reached me. Uh, so, so you made the video, and and then what happened? <laughs> you right. So, and and taking that video as an example, because this is specifically what I was doing in that video. And later, after I had posted it, I did a whole blog post where I laid it all out and explained it. Right. Right. So the, the most of the videos I make. The explanations in the video that video i made to flex on people okay uh, and the reason i did that is because i was just tired of watching whack-ass shingy videos i'm like mm. you guys suck <laughs> like i let me let me put this out but the outline of the video is the consistent method so you have total body exercise which is running uh you see me on there like flipping the bean bag so this is sending power <laughs> And in that same direction, so I can strike, I can send this bag out, I can thrust with the stick, I can thrust with the sword, I can thrust with the staff. I have leg method, body method, hand method. This is what we mean when we talk about consistent method, that once we're working in this direction, that applies to different objects and different kinds of movements in, in a consistent way, right? And the basic idea, and I think this is the secret genius of Xing Yi as a style is that if you practice in that way based on direction it gives you a great deal of body control and ways of moving and attacking right so up down left right front back open close and then spiral if you uh kind of isolate those and train them leg method body method hand method it just gives you a great deal of versatility in terms of how you can move how you can move. Um, that being said, it's also, Shingy has no copyright on that. Like direction right. is direction, principle is principle. You know what right. I mean? Um, right. I primarily work with the forms of Shingy and the internal arts when I do my videos, mainly because I think there's a, a good niche there to fill, frankly, because the overall level in terms of body movement or quote unquote combat effectiveness of people who do the internal arts is really low. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I could have done Wing Chun. Like I know Silam Tao. Right. right. <laughs> All these videos could have been in the essence of see like, no, but I like Shingy. I like Bakwa. I like Tai Chi. So I'm working with those. Have you had a lot of students come your way that had, had previous uh, experience in these arts? So uh, I'm, what I'm curious about is like, f let's take Shingy, for example, as someone come to you as a, already had a Shingy background, have you been able to see a, 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 a change in their technique as a result of using these principles? Like if they already were coming from an art like Shingy or blah, blah. I've never personally had any students that came from an internal arts background. Um, that said, uh, one of the seminars that we did, this was in Rochester, New York. The, the teacher there was a guy named Bud, uh, Bud Gardner. He had a background in the internal arts, Xing Yi and Bakwa and Tai Chi. Um, because we're just doing a seminar, we're only there for a weekend. 
Um, I never had the opportunity to see with him or his students specifically how it eventually made a difference in his movement or training method. Um, however, it was an eye opener for me because this was before YouTube, right? right? We're talking 2003, right? Uh, it was eye opening for me to see other people doing the same style as me and the same style that I was learning from Master Sue, but you know they were whack. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, did you tell them that? Not, not to, no, no disrespect to, 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 but I'm just saying like, it's like, yeah. whoa, this is very like rigid and fetishized yeah. and like they can't really do much. And mm. that's kind of the default, you know, when it comes yeah. to those arts. So, yeah, unfortunately. So, you know, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's a lot of historical reasons for that that are, pretty interesting actually but you know I'll put it this way you'll find a lot more people who are let's say Wing Chun students who just can move better yeah you know what I mean and maybe that's because Wing Chun's a more popular art globally more people are doing it or different historical circumstances you know what I mean like there's there's very particular reasons why the Neja have in the Western world become associated with kind of like new age type folks, mm. you know, Kung Fu for health, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, there's a history behind that, but it's like, yeah, I'm Yizong, like we fight. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that has to be there. I think for it, to, for it to be, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to say that someone has to fight, you know, to, to be a martial artist, there's different reasons to do martial arts, but uh, you know, right. There's you can definitely tell a difference in the in the uh, fluidity and athleticism of a person's movements when they're they're using it because it has to be it has to be functional it has to be able to be used for what it was intended originally I guess right right and I'm like you know fighting is not my specialty right, right. Uh, exercise methods are my right. specialty training right. methods are my specialty so I don't want to put too much on the fighting thing but as you said, like, not everybody's into that, number one. And even a lot of people who are don't necessarily need those skills. That's like, some of these folks are kind of weirdos. <laughs> yeah, sure. like, oh, here's all the ways you can kill a man. Like, right, yeah. who are you killing? Like, what are you talking about? It's very um, odd. And I noticed that it's it's much more prevalent in certain martial arts than others. I don't really want to name names and make anybody upset. but um, Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I, I don't want to put too much on that aspect of it, but even for people who are not interested in that or for whom it's not a crucial concern, you can still research your movement and your style and develop sure. some skills, you know, and so that's kind of more my focus, you know. So you, you teach privately in, in Oakland, right? Correct. What what kind of uh, what kind of people come to you as students? Are they people that are looking for self defense skills, or is it people who are looking for an alternative form of exercise, or or what kind of what kind of students do you have? Is it a mixture of people? Um, it's generally pretty random mm. uh, for a couple of reasons. So, for one thing, uh, I don't publicly advertise my teaching. Um, I this is one of those things. It's always in the background of my mind, like, oh, I'm going to put up a Craigslist post and try to get some more students. And it just never happens because I do a lot of different things. Like I'm a musician, I'm a writer, I teach Kung Fu, I edit videos. I'm just like, I always have other things going on. So generally it's like people find me right. um, or I'll meet them randomly. So like I had a couple of students who uh, were Kung Fu guys, like Wing Chun and Northern Shaolin. Uh, one of them also had learned like, Spanish knife fighting and German longsword and this other kind of stuff. Uh, other folks generally have sought me out because they heard about me through the rivers and lakes. <laughs> so like there was a guy who was a Chinese guy born and raised in Oakland who came through one of the classes. He was a Wing Chun guy, but he had also studied Gao style Bakwa. And so no. he had heard about me and that I was teaching in Oakland. Um, my main private student for the last couple of years uh, 
he's quite older than me. He's in his early 60s. Uh, his background is primarily in karate, like Okinawan, and he did Shotokan for a long time. But same thing, like he heard about Master Su through whoever, whoever, and then found out that I was teaching in Oakland. He lives in Fresno. So mm -hmm. once a week, he's driving out here three hours and wow. we do our thing. And that's that's how it goes. So, yeah, it's been pretty random how people have, have found me. Um, there's been other folks who've seen like the videos on my YouTube channel, but they tend to be from here, there and everywhere. You know what I mean? So people hit me up and ask me if I do online classes. Like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not with you want an online class. It's called my YouTube channel. Go do that stuff. <laughs> and when you're good at it, uh, fly me out for a seminar and we'll do the thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So generally when people come to you, they already know what you're all about. You know, there's, um, they're, they're looking for you specifically. Basically, yeah. Right. And then I had another student for a while who I knew cause we had worked together briefly, uh, back when I was working at a nonprofit. And so he knew I taught Kung Fu and like we were Facebook friends or whatever. Um, and he specifically wanted to learn Bakwa. He was interested in that. And the reason he was interested in that is because he spent a number of years as a professional sign spinner, right? Um, I don't know if this is a thing out in Kentucky, like we have a really big, is, yeah. okay, like the real big four foot signs. And this is a big thing. There's a whole subculture of this. They have, they have competitions. Wow. Like we're That's... all going out to Las Vegas and see who can do the craziest trick with a, a sign. Wow. Um, so there's like, this is object method, right? They're manipulating something and doing all kind of wild stuff with it. So he's, he had seen Bakwa videos online and made a mental connection between those. Okay. And so he had, Hey, I want to learn Bakwa. I was like, ah, you need to learn Shingy first. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, you know, you mentioned earlier about, you know, some Shingy practitioners and pe other people, internal art artists that you've seen that sort of had, you know, uh, stiff wooden movements. What, what do you think it is that some traditional teachers, not not anyone specifically, but maybe in general, what, what do you think it is that they're doing wrong that was done differently in the past? Uh, I can't speak for the past because I wasn't there. Well, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's like... Uh, it's the nat the the it's the nature of tradition, right? Like, okay, if I'm gonna do something I don't like to do, which is I'm gonna talk a bunch about fighting and warfare. Okay. <laughs> like fighting. What kind of fighting anyway? Um so sticking to China, martial arts for most most of Chinese history are basically a trade skill. Right. right. A working class trade skill, largely for rural youth who are like, oh, you're the seventh son and we don't have anything for you. All right. Well, I need to figure something out. Right. right. So you learn martial arts. OK. You learn a hand style. You learn weapons so that you can either join the military. Right. That's part of the, the tryouts. If you want to join the military like, oh, you got some Kung Fu? Sure. Or become a, a bodyguard or caravan guard or join the opera mm -hmm. right sorry right. or be a kung fu busker like you mm -hmm. know travel around from town to town do some stuff sell some potions and collect money you know what i mean it's a trade skill right right uh if you're talking combative application that is a very specific kind of trade skill right that's uh, a useful and necessary skill in a very particular context, right? Times of war, times of strife. Well, if things are peaceful, this is, or, or amongst uh, classes of people where things are peaceful, right? Like it wasn't until the early 1900s that suddenly middle-class intellectuals are now interested in Kung Fu, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was not the case before. So in those environments and in those contexts, this is when what we know of as traditional martial arts styles coalesce into being, basically when they're not being used. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 
it, at that time, this is also like a lot of things are going on at that time, early late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the economy of China is becoming monetized, right? Because yeah. of all the silver and gold that the Spanish stole from what's now South America that made Europe wealthy, that money flowed into China. Now globalization is beginning. You have a monetized economy. Now you have a marketplace where people who have Kung Fu now suddenly have a potential audience of folks who have disposable income that can pay for instruction. This is when this, the, the whole, this is this style, this is that style, this is this style starts to come into being. So I do white eyebrow, I do Wing Chun, I do Hungar, I do this, I do that, right? Uh, that's when that begins. So these folks who have these skills it's no longer a trade skill in the sense that it was before. Yeah. The teacher is the trade skill. Right. Right. And teaching and transmission is dependent on authority, the authority of the past, the authority of the dictates of structure that differ in one style from another. So when that's your environment, it's, it's a, it's, it's inherently conservative. So, mm -hmm. It, the, the, the options of what you can do or be are going to continually shrink. Fast forward a couple of generations and you have people who are, oh, this is the secret on Jing dark power of, ah, and they do this weird stuff. It's like, it's just the nature of the thing, right? right? Um, and it, it, if anything, at the, the thing about essence of evolution is this. It's just a theory and a practice, right? You need something to apply it to. Right. right. So I don't mean to like crap too much on traditional arts, because here's the thing. If those people hadn't done that and passed that on, there would be no style to learn to then apply this theory to. Right. right? Like you need some kind of a, a basis. Uh, but yeah, it's just the nature of tradition for it to, to just stagnate. Like it. Sure. Uh, it's like sharks. If they're not swimming up, they sink. They die. Yeah. So that that leads me into my next question pretty neatly, actually. Uh, you know, you you've uh, mentioned wanting to keep your own lineage alive. And of course you're bringing new things to it and your, your teacher brought new things to it. What do you think the future of these types of arts, Naja arts is, is going to be like in the West? Where, where do you see this going? You see them becoming more popular or fading away. Mm. As a lot of people assume that they would do with the advent of MMA. I, I do want to clarify one thing that my primary focus and concern right. is the that the theory of essence of evolution is publicly available for people to access mm. right? right that's not i don't think of that as a lineage this is just right. anybody can pick this up i could explain eoe to somebody with whom i do not share a spoken language right, right. yeah um uh, and really if somebody is a little bit smart and a little bit clever it probably wouldn't take more than a couple of hours for me to give them enough that they could take that and run with it right right, right. now as far as the lineage of specifically my styles right. it would be lovely if i could pass those on eat zong for life mm -hmm. uh but it's not my focus <laughs> right. right you know um as far as what the future looks like for those uh it's hard for me to say i mean I'm doing my part to popularize Xing Yi, so we'll see. Right. It, right. It, it, it needs it. Xing Yi doesn't have a Bruce Lee. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. Well, I don't Actually, know. It, it might. Yeah. No, no, nobody has the Bruce Lee. <laughs> <laughs> like the, we, the reason most Westerners have heard of Kung Fu is because yeah. of Bruce Lee. Right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so where it's going to go in the future, I don't know. I, I think, you know, here in the Western world, Xingyi and Bakwa are pretty obscure, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. but the people who are, I think they'll always be around, you know, as a lot, as much future as we have left on this planet. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see <laughs> oh, what happens. Hold on a second. I'm getting a, I'm getting a technical. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. You're freezing uh, up on me a little so bit. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. My internet connection is a little bit unstable is the message I got. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You're good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they'll linger around. Beyond that, I can't say. Um, I, I don't think something like Bakwa will ever be 
very popular because it's a little too weird. Yeah. You know, like, what are these people walking around in a circle for? Like, yeah. uh, well, they don't even know. <laughs> like the, the interesting thing about Bakwa as a system is it's it, even though they refer to the Neja as Taoist arts, right. uh, this is somewhat disingenuous. And that's part yeah. of the subject of the essay I'm getting ready to send you. Um, okay. Right. However, Bakwa is the only one of those three styles, Shingi, Bakwa, Tai Chi, that has explicit historical links to Taoist religious practices. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there's something a little kooky about Bakwa just as an art. Um, tai Chi is the most popular Kung Fu style on planet Earth. Sure. Uh, yeah. old, it, it, if there is a city and there are Chinese people there, you can go to the park and they're out there doing Tai Chi. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Shingi. We'll see. Yeah. Like I said, doing my part. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoy your channel. Um, so what what are your plans for the future What with uh, EOE America? Uh, you, you mentioned to me at one point that you were thinking about starting a Patreon this year, possibly. Are you still planning on doing that? Correct. So there's always going to be the free, publicly accessible YouTube channel. Here's the theory. Here's how to apply it, whatever, whatever. Um, however, as uh, a very wise man named Joker said in the dark night, uh, if you're good at something, never do it for free. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm planning to start up the, the Patreon and have, uh, more kind of like a wider variety or, or more intricate or detailed, like, okay, here's how you use this to practice a certain type of technique, or here's this, or here's that just stuff that's a, a a a little bit more precious to me in terms of like training methods I've developed and if I'm going to share these you need to pay for that mm -hmm. um so that's definitely part of the plot what I would really like to do um and I'm starting to do a little bit is travel more and teach seminars you know yeah. um this next month I'm doing a seminar at a school in Redwood City here in the Bay Area and it's looking like I may be working with the, the owner and main instructor of that school to do more stuff in the future. Right. So I'm hoping that will serve as a kind of base of operations for me to do things there or maybe host seminars there, possibly do an ongoing class there, that kind of a thing. But, you know, I want to travel and I've had people hit me up here and there who've seen the YouTube channel or who heard about Master Sue or whatever or like, well, would you come out to Chicago and do a seminar? Like if the price is right. Yeah. Right. Like, right. That's, that flight ain't cheap. <laughs> right. Yeah. You got to cover your expenses at least for sure. Yeah. So I, I, I really would like to, to be able to teach and share EOE and the training methods with as many people as possible. Yeah. Well, hopefully this will help get the word out just a little bit. Um, and uh, of course, you're continuing with your blog. And then you, you've also, as you just mentioned, you've written an article for the the Dowie blog. Oh, mm -hmm. And you said that's about the historical connections between Taoism and Bagua. Is that, is that the subject of the article? Uh, the, the article is basically like this. Everybody says the Neja are Taoist arts. And that's not uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> and here's why. Uh, just a, kind of a brief overview. A lot of what people think of when they think of the internal arts and actually even bigger than that a lot of what people think about when they think about kung fu and what kung fu is about uh all of those ideas originate with one man and that's sun lutong mm, uh, yeah he died in 1933 which right. was two years before my dad was born mm -hmm. right he was a writer a philosopher a taoist mystic and he was writing at a time when China was trying to come up in the world. Like they had been occupied by various foreign powers for a very long time. Right. Like the whole Qing dynasty was a foreign dynasty. They're Manchurian. Right. Right. And then Europe showed up and divided up China amongst itself and Japan invaded and whatever. So a lot of Chinese uh, intellectuals were deploying nationalist sentiment as a way to just boost people up right yeah. psychologically and socially this is when i don't know if you're familiar with jing wu and that whole yeah. movement mm -hmm. uh all of that kind of stuff the 
uh, turning martial arts into a benefit society type right. of a thing. Right. This is when Sun Luton was writing his books. So mm -hmm. it blew up like the atomic bomb. Yeah. Sun Luton is by far the most influential writer on the subject of Kung Fu of the modern era. So much so that so many of the ideas he developed are embedded in terms of how people now conceive of Kung Fu that you wouldn't even know they came from him. Right. 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 And so that's the subject of the article is here's kind of where this came from. Here's my take on it and essence of evolution and that take on it. Like, let me put on my EOE hat and let's talk about this. Like, you want to talk about the Tao? Gravity. <laughs> Great. I'm looking forward to that. So I guess we're about out of time. Is there anything else that you wanted to promote or talk about before we wrap up here? Uh, just to let people know to subscribe to that YouTube channel. EOE America is the name of the channel. Um, I'm continuing to produce videos. I'm sitting on one now that needs to be edited about the, the Xing Yi opening, like the beginning of the forum. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. oh, is your opening empty ritual or is there something going on here? Well, here's a way to analyze that. And I'm going to continue producing videos like that. So everybody needs to subscribe to the channel. And uh, I can be reached by email at eoeamerica at hotmail.com. Anybody who's interested in finding out more can contact me directly. And yeah, keep training. Awesome. I definitely recommend that everybody check out the channel. It's a uh, very unique, very thought provoking, good stuff. I appreciate it.